I um, am about to start my fourth year. Um, and today we are going to be talking about um, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and, and this kind of inflammatory bowel disease um, starts uh, or, or kind of encompasses um, two uh, different pathologies, um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So we're gonna kind of walk through um, an example, uh, a case in, in terms of that. Um, if you're new um, to virtual rounds, welcome. Um, again, for those people that kind of just signed in, um, my name is Emma. Um, I uh, am fortunate enough to, to have talked to you guys last week um, and then uh, fortunate enough to come back and talk to you guys again this week. Um, the, so um, I did place a um, few links in the chat for those of you that are applying um, this cycle. Um, be sure to check out um, MotivateMD's resources, um, one of which is in the medical school application um, Google Doc that was put in the chat. Um, there are a lot of good um, people who work for Motivate MD that are willing to help you um, with your med school journey. If you have any questions about this, uh, feel free to, to ask any questions uh, throughout the presentation, okay? All right, so in terms of uh, recommended reads, um, this is another one from uh, the, uh, um, the publication in training. Um, I hope you guys had a chance to, to uh, read the one last week. Did you guys, uh, those of you that are, are um, coming again, did you guys get a chance to read the last one? Good. So Jenna says yes. Perfect. I was waiting there for somebody. Thank, thank you. Uh, at least somebody was out there. I heard crickets for a minute. Um, but this one is a really good one as well. So this kind of um, a little bit of a, a kind of synopsis, a Cliff Notes version. Um, this is about a um, medical student of whom um, is kind of recounting her own journey with um, psoriatic arthritis. So I thought this was a good um, kind of story. Um, it, it's also a short read too. Um, I think it's hard to sometimes give you guys whole novels to read because you don't have a lot of time to sit and read them. So these short articles, I think, um, are, are, are really good reads for you guys um, in that regard. So uh, check this one out. Um, I, I think it's a, um, a good read. Um, in the, the resources, my slides should be there and, and there, there's a link of which you can click on for that. Um, but um, let's keep going. Um, I like to give you guys a, a joke here, um, and this is absolutely something I can attest to. When I saw this, um, I knew that I had to put it into the um, into the presentation for you guys to to um, to see. But this is absolutely true. I know that my friends can attest to this. I know that my spouse can attest to this, um, and I, I think it's uh, really funny. And I hope you guys do too, and you're not too alarmed by this. Um, but as always, I have a uh, a poll here. Um, I'm going to share this with you. Please uh, feel free to put in your um, honest opinions here um, in terms of uh, what you know about inflammatory bowel disease. All right, so you guys answered very quickly. I hope we get this much participation throughout the, throughout the talk. All right, so the majority of you guys, um, it looks like you know over half of you guys um, said either I know nothing or I know a little. That's absolutely okay. Um, I hope to break it down for you, um, inflammatory bowel disease that is, break that down for you so that you guys are able to really understand um, you know, the, the ins and outs of inflammatory bowels from, you know, how a, a patient presents to um, diagnosis and treatment as well. Okay, so um, that's okay. So we use this as a compare and contrast to the end um, when, we, when we talk about that as well. Um, so let's see. All right, so as always, um, what we're gonna do is kind of walk through a case. Um, we're gonna go through the physical exam. We're gonna discuss the differential diagnosis. Um, and as kind of a foreshadowing, I'm going to kind of elicit more of a, a participation for making the differential diagnosis. Um, we're going to have a, really an active session where we list the differential diagnosis. Um, so hopefully a lot of participation on your guys' end. 
Um, then we're really going to transition into the assessment and plan. Um, and then we're going to talk about the pathology of the disease. Um, and I know that that is the part where you guys usually get the most out of. So we'll try to emphasize that as well. Um, and then your guys' role, as always, please participate. If you feel more comfortable um, unmuting yourself, please do. I don't mind that at all. Um, or if you're more comfortable typing in the chat, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, I brought coffee with me to, to kind of wait um, as you guys uh, type in your responses. Um, and then as always, uh, fill in the, the soap note form. Um, I did put that link in the chat for you guys. So um, fill that out. And once you, you fill that out and submit them, you'll get, and, and when you uh, complete the quiz as well, um, you will um, then receive a, a certificate of completion for, for this session. And here is kind of the example of the soap note form. Um, for those of you that are brand new to um, this session, uh, the, the SOAP note is basically the, the note that um, physicians and, um, and residents and medical students um, write their, their notes. Um, the subjective um, is, includes the HPI and the ROS. So what we're talking about is things that the patient is telling us. So um, if they came in, they said they were short of breath, that's what the patient's telling you. If you listen to their lungs and it, uh, they have wheezes, that's what we find. That's what we're gonna put into the objective under the physical exam, okay? And then uh, as I was kind of alluding to, um, objective is the, um, the things of which that we find. So vital signs, physical exam. Then assessment is going to kind of lay out your differential diagnoses. And then plan is how we're going to address those differential diagnoses and rule in or rule out or address the, the, um, the pathology that we're dealing with. So um, this is a 26-year-old male, very young patient, uh, presenting uh, or with no past medical history. That's what PMH stands for. Uh, presenting to the clinic with a two-month history of alternating diarrhea, about five uh, stools per day, um, and constipation with the presence of occasional blood and mucus. Um, he notes that he has some diffuse abdominal pain, which is not improved or worsened by any specific activity. Um, before approximately two months ago, the patient had not experienced uh, this pain. Family history is significant for a mother with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and rheumatoid arthritis, as well as a sister with psor um, psoriasis. The patient also describes fatigue, a 10-pound ten, a weight loss over two months, uh, back pain and occasional shortness of breath with exertion, but denies any fever chills, changes in stool caliber or palpitations. Uh, no home treatments for this episode of symptoms. So already we see there's a lot going on with this patient and this patient is young. Um, undeniably, no one should be dealing with this. And it's, it's pretty alarming if a very young, uh, otherwise healthy young person is, is dealing with this. So um, that being said, I have a few questions for you guys to consider here. Number one, um, what, do we, what differentials do we wanna consider right now? Kind of knowing, um, knowing what we, we kind of know now. This patient has um, alternating diarrhea and constipation that, is, uh, that has mucus and blood. So what do we wanna consider here? Infection, sure. Colon cancer, absolutely. We can consider organ failure, yeah. I think you guys, be sure to kind of um, make a broad differential here. Um, it, you know, just because we, we know the topic doesn't mean we can't include in other things of which can be causing this patient's symptoms, okay? Anything else? What are you guys thinking? We're, we're, we're going a lot of um, diet, sure, sure, exactly. Yeah, we can have, you know, certainly um, an episode of, of, of food poisoning. Um, it seems, and diet in the way of, of something else that um, also causes diarrhea. Can you guys pinpoint that? Celiac disease, good. Um, IBS, certainly, yeah. Irritable bowel syndrome can certainly cause that, especially in the way of alternating diarrhea and constipation. Um, something in the autoimmune category. Great job, Rachel, you picked that up. And that was gonna be one of the next questions that I asked in terms of the family history. Great job uh, pinpointing that two of the relatives have um, very prominent um, autoimmune conditions. Good. Um, anything else? All right. 
Um, so the next question is, um, what is the what is the association with the list of family history? Rachel absolutely beat us to the punch, and she told us that this might be an autoimmune condition, given the there's a strong family history of autoimmune um, diseases. So good good job, Rachel, with that. So what questions should we ask before proceeding? Uh, what do we want to know from this patient? Recent travel, absolutely, Brandon, you're absolutely right. Anything else we wanna ask this patient? Any changes in activity? Sure. Yeah, has the diet been altered? Absolutely, good. Um, and then one question, additional question, it's not on my list, I do have one more for you, but, um, and uh, Shelly said, has it happened before and how often? Good. Um, one question I do have for you guys is, um, what's the significance of asking if there's a change in the stool caliber? Meaning, what's the importance of, of asking if the stool has changed um, in, in size? Because there may be a stricture. Sure, yeah, not so much a, a, a stricture, but something of which uh, can be obstruct, obstructing the, the lumen of the uh, colon. So uh, sort of along those lines, um, which would be a mass associated with colon cancer. Absolutely. To rule out obstruction. Sure, exactly. Good. Any other um, questions we need to ask this patient? And then my next question for you guys is, what areas of the body do we want to examine on this patient? What do we want to kind of, if we were doing a focused um, physical exam, what do we want to, what do we want to kind of hone in on? Abdomen and skin. Why skin, Brandon? Good. Yeah, autoimmune, sure. Especially with a, a, a sister of whom has a sorry, or a psoriasis. Um, perfect, what else? Other than the abdomen, do we wanna look at? Yeah, we can try to localize the pain to a specific quadrant, absolutely. What about his back pain? What's the significance of this? Do we want to examine his back or say, eh, you're having diarrhea, so we don't want to really worry about your back? Yeah, we can we can certainly pinpoint the uh, the renal system, see if there's any signs of uh, infection in that regard. Joints, spondylitis. Sure, we want to consider all of these things. All right, so in terms of uh, physical exam, this is what we find. Um, so we'll kind of uh, walk through this together, um, but there are a few things of which are prominent to pay attention for. So number one, um, the, the patient um, is, uh, let's start with the one in the bottom left. So we pull down uh, this young man's eyebrow, or not eyebrows, we don't pull their eyebrows down, but their eyelids rather. Um, we pull down the eyelids um, and we see right here, what we're looking at is the conjunctiva. Um, if I were to pull down mine, um, you would probably see that it's pink. Um, you know, there's lots of color uh, and, and, you know, I'm likely well hydrated. For this, uh, for this gentleman, we see a little bit of pallor. Um, so what is, what is that telling us? Sure, it tells us that there is anemia. And yes, Madeline and Rachel, those can't, the, the source of the anemia can be due to iron deficiency. What from the history tells us that he may have iron deficiency? Sure, absolutely fatigue, yeah, you're right. Blood in the stool, good, yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, so this is a, they're, they're, it's a chronic blood loss is, is likely what might be causing his anemia. You know, certainly we wanna look at other tests to pinpoint this, um, but that's just one part. So then um, after he pulls down his eyelids, um, we, we have, or he says, you know, I've also had these sores in my mouth. He kind of pulls down his lip and then you see this. Um, what, is, what is this? Does anybody have any ideas? Yeah, good. We have an, uh, an aphthous ulcer here. 
um, which is set, essentially is a is a cute way of saying a canker sore. Um, so um, th this isn't, and, and this is not to be confused with um, HSV, herpes simplex. Um, they're, they're a little bit different in appearance. What we see here is a little bit of irritation and, and erythema, um, whereas with HSV, um, it, it doesn't necessarily look like, like that. Um, it doesn't have that irritation, the erythema. Okay, um, now um, we uh, see on his leg here, it looks like his left leg, um, we see this. What is this? Do you guys know, have an idea what this is? And if you don't know, describe it for me. Um, so use kind of, say you're the, um, you're the physician um, and, and nobody is there to consult you. I am not in the room, nobody's here. You guys have to document this. What would you, how would you describe it? So kind of general rules to go by is what's the size, um, what is kind of the characteristics and where is it located? So let's start there. So let's see if we can't describe this together. So first let's pinpoint the size. What would you call this? What size? So lower shin. So we have uh, one, um, so lower shin, yeah, I would say anterior, anterior left, um, anterior left uh, lower leg uh, is how we can describe it. Good. And, and then anybody for a size, I know it's hard to tell based on this. Um, I think there's actually uh, a curiously a ruler behind, but we can't really see that. Um, anybody want to guess a size here? big. <laughs> You're not wrong. It is big. Um, yeah, exactly. So what we, um, yeah, you can offer approximate measurements and the way that um, we can um, really pinpoint is by um, the, the best way and the, the most important thing to remember is at some point um, you can measure your fingers and know what your fingers are in, in sonometers. Um, and then when you measure it, um, you'll, you'll kind of know. Um, so this is pretty big. I might say maybe four by two. It's pretty large and, and based on it kind of zoomed in, it's hard to, to really pinpoint. So, um, so yeah, so, and, and then um, we might say uh, perhaps an ulceration, okay? And, and that is really going to uh, lead us to what this really is. What this is called is a uh, pyoderma gangrenosum, and it's kind of an ulceration of the skin. And what we're gonna find is that this is a, certainly associated with the pathology that we're dealing with today, okay? So good job on all these. You guys definitely pinpointed all of these um, these associations here. Um, can I type that in the chat? Absolutely. It's hard to, so good thing I'm decent. I know how to spell this word. Pyoderma gangrenosum. There you go. Um, so that's how we call it. Pyoderma gangrenosum. And it, yeah, I'm, I'm like you, Rachel. I need to see it to know how to say it um, because a lot of times it helps you to enunciate. All right, so we do a rectal exam on this patient and we put um, it on the, the card. We drop, we put the droppers, the indicator, and we see this. Is this positive or negative? And for those of you that are unfamiliar with the, the GUIAC test, um, what we're doing is we're doing a rectal exam um, and with your glove, um, what you're gonna do is take a little bit of stool, place it on the card, and then put drops of the indicator. Um, and if it, if it changes color, um, I'm giving away the answer. If it changes color, then that is positive, indicative of um, iron or blood being in the stool. So good, this is positive. And we're seeing that blue indicator change, indicating to us that there is in fact blood in the stool. Because what we want to remember is when a patient comes and tells us that there's blood in the stool or that, you know, their, their stool is black or their stool is dark colored, we want to ask certain questions. Um, the hemocult test, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing. Yeah, we call it uh, Guayac um, because I believe hemocult is actually the brand of a, a card um, and there may be different ones if I'm not mistaken. Um, but um, when a patient comes to us and tells us that their stool is dark, we want to obviously have a differential for this um, because, you know, we don't want to go, um, you know, subjecting someone to a colonoscopy if they had, you know, for instance, um, 
Pepto-Bismol the night before, which um, turns your stool dark, okay? So we want to do a simple non-invasive test like this. Um, it's slightly non-invasive. Obviously it's a rectal exam, so it's kind of invasive. Um, but uh, this is a positive test. So good job with this one, guys. So let's go on to the um, physical exam. And if you guys have any questions at all, please um, put them in the chat um, or unmute your mic. Uh, so the, his temperature is 100.2. So we're, we're, it's pretty elevated. Uh, we can't exactly call it a fever, perhaps uh, low grade. Um, his, his heart rate is at 101. Uh, blood pressure is a little bit low, so he's hypotensive. Other than this, he's cachectic appearing, um, but he's alert and oriented, to, um, meaning to person, place, and time. His pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light. Um, he does have dry mucous membranes, and he has the presence of two aphthous ulcers. That's what we just saw before on his um, uh, buccal mucosa. He's tachycardic, and he has a um, systolic murmur. Um, is this reminiscent um, to anyone of anything that I've talked to you guys about before? Come on, make me proud. Uh, I, I've talked to you about a lot of things and I try to bring them back to you guys so that you can see them in context with another thing. There is a few things I've talked to you about. Um, the, tachycardi the tachycardia, um, the, um, the subconjunctival pallor, and the systolic murmur. All of those kind of go in together with, with one condition that I've talked to you about. Anemia, good, exactly. Um, the lungs are clear rotation without wheezes, rails, or bronchi. There is diffuse abdominal tenderness, so it doesn't kind of localize to one area. And we don't palpate any masses, which is good. Um, we have guaiac positive stool, as we saw in the last slide. And the, um, the extremities um, have one plus edema to the lower um, extremities. Um, and there's a three by three area of ulceration present on the lo left lower extremity. So um, this is measured out as, as 3.3. Well, that's what we document at least. All right, so um, there's our physical exam um, and, and here's our laboratory studies. So it looks like, um, and, and remember I put the key up for you in the upper right hand corner there. Um, so let's kind of go through this together. So our CMP is normal. So our um, sodium is normal, our potassium is normal. Um, we also see a normal um, chloride, we see a normal CO2, normal BUN creatinine, and normal glucose, which is great. Um, we see uh, over here though, um, before we go on to the CBC, um, we see a CRP and an ESR of which are elevated both of them. So what, what does this tell us? Oh, good question about the, the chloride. So that should read 105, not 15. Great point. So yes, uh, CRP, which is the C-reactive protein and the E stands for erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Those are both non-specific um, indicators of inflammation. If they're elevated, it tells us um, perhaps there's an inflammatory process going on in the body, but it doesn't tell us where. Much like the D-dimer for um, clotting, it tells us that something is going on, but it doesn't necessarily tell us where. So it's kind of, you know, one of the first tier tests that we, we want to, you know, perhaps use to tell us where there's inflammation in the body. Um, other than this, um, the calprotectin is elevated. So is there any um, wise, wise students in the audience that can tell me what calprotectin is and what it elevated means? Think along the lines of the GI tract. While you guys are typing in or, or pondering your responses, we'll continue on to the um, CBC over here. So we do have an elevated white count. So it tells us perhaps there's an infection going on. And as you guys kind of uh, indicated, um, and as a student wisely pointed out, you guys 
nothing can get past you guys. So this should say 105, not 15, because if it were 15, it would be incredibly low. Um, other than this, um, we do have a low hemoglobin and we have a, um, a low hematocrit. Um, remember my rule, hemoglobin times three should be roughly the hematocrit. Um, this is to make sure, um, mainly for quality control. Um, and, and we get basically um, 10.4 times three is you know around 31.3. Um, so I guess um, you guys are stumped in terms of the calprotectin, and that's okay. Calprotectin is um, a much like the CRP and ESR is a non-specific sign of um, inflammation in the GI tract, um, and 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 it being elevated and in the kind of presence in clinical picture associated with diarrhea, mucus, and blood can kind of tell us maybe something is going on specific to the GI tract having inflammation. Okay. Um, other than this, the platelets are normal, okay? All right, let me clear all this out. And now, what additional testing or imaging do we need? What do we want to order? So you guys are, are at the computer. Can we get an ab abdominal x-ray? Certainly we can, and that would be a good idea to start with. Absolutely, we can get an abdominal x-ray to kind of rule in or rule out um, certain things. What would we want to rule in or out with an abdominal x-ray? So good, the, the rule with, no, with ordering things is you, you uh, need to know why you're ordering things, why to rule them or what you're ruling in or ruling out. So good, if we're, and with an abdominal x-ray, what is more um, life-threatening to pinpoint with an abdominal x-ray in the presence of, of diarrhea, more likely in the presence of, of vomiting, um, but what else do we wanna rule in or rule out? It's also a surgical emergency. Perforation, certainly. Tumor or obstruction. You guys are right on track. What I was going for was an uh, appendicitis you, you can't see from a, um, an x-ray. Um, but what I was going for is a, a, a bowel obstruction. That's really what we can see from an x-ray. Uh, appendicitis, um, more specifically, you would need a, an ultrasound um, for right lower quadrant compression sign or a CT to, to visualize a, an inflamed appendix. Um, abdominal x-ray is a great start. Um, so we got an abdominal x-ray and it's, it's completely normal. We have a completely normal x-ray. What do you guys want to order now? Colonoscopy, all right, good. Um, because of the guaiac test, absolutely. Yeah, we can order a sonogram as well. And, and getting an ultrasound can certainly help. Um, so I have one vote for colonoscopy. Does anybody agree with colonoscopy? Oh, I have two votes for colonoscopy. So we do have a CRP, CRP is elevated. Anybody else agree with colonoscopy? Or disagree? Okay, so who's gonna tell the patient to, to drink the, the jug of prep? I'm not, you guys can. All right, so um, let's see here. So we did get a colonoscopy. Um, so first, um, what I want to do is, I, it's a very quick video. Um, and I want to show you it here. Um, and what we're seeing here um, as we go through, um, and, and I thought this was a great video. Um, I did find one video of which was like age restricted because um, apparently it, this is like um, adult rated content. Um, but going through, um, what we're seeing here is, is kind of uh, friable mucosa. We're seeing superficial ulcerations of the mucosa. And we're seeing, you know, what looks like a little bit of bleeding, a little bit of um, punctate hemorrhages um, throughout. So when this video started, um, it was uh, at the, the level of the transverse colon. Um, and then as he kind of... Uh, 
seeds um, in the video, he's starting to kind of come out here. And you are seeing a little residual stool there. So sorry if anybody's eating dinner out there, I didn't warn you. But if it was a colonoscopy, I feel like it was fair game. Um, so he's kind of backing out um, as he, he backs out here, um, out. And now at the level of um, what looks like the, um, he's starting to back out to the sigmoid colon here. And as he's coming out, he's getting closer to the rectum. And you see kind of the air go there. And what he's doing now is um, taking a biopsy. And, and that is certainly um, always a part of um, colonoscopy. Um, if there were to be polyps, they would be taken out and examined. Um, but that's what we're doing here. We're in the rectum right now and getting uh, tissue. So kind of using that uh, tool there to kind of uh, take some of the tissue so the pathologist can look at it underneath the microscope. Okay, so um, use your pointers here. Tell me, was this um, colonoscopy normal or abnormal? An episode of the Magic School Bus, except for I'm not, I'm probably not as fun as, uh, as fun as uh, Miss Frizzle. She's probably more fun than I am. Everybody says abnormal and you guys would be absolutely right. And in the, um, the bottom right hand corner, there is the famous jug of prep. It's polyethylene glycol mixed with water. Um, and it's nobody's favorite. Um, and the whole premise of it really is, um, you know, not because physicians, uh, gastroenterologists want you to be on um, the, the toilet the day before. Um, but because they really want the colon to be kind of cleared out um, and, and not have a stool in there. And if there is stool, we want it to be liquid stool so that um, we can kind of advance through the colon and get a good idea of what's going on there. Um, you know, as you can imagine, if there was lots of stool in that colon, we wouldn't be able to kind of see the mucosa and see those ulcerations, see the, the punctate hemorrhages and the, the kind of friable mucosa that was going on there. Okay. So in case you were wondering about the, the notorious uh, jug of, of polyethylene glycol, it is huge. <laughs> and a lot of, I've heard like a lot of patients carry it around and stuff. Um, or at least carried around their house. I hope they're not, you know, doing the prep somewhere else. That would be horrible. Um, but at any rate, enough about the prep. Let's continue going. All right, so here's our biopsy. Um, let me clear that for you. All the, um, all the, the pointer is still on there. All right. So um, here is our biopsy results. Um, we see on the left something going on, but rather let's start with um, the right. That's a little bit easier. Um, and I have a picture for you next to kind of show you what's normal. And when we look at the mucosa, what we should kind of see is something, you know, the, we should see crypts kind of like this. And what we're seeing is kind of this distortion of the crypts here. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of inflammation with um, white blood cells. That's what we're kind of seeing here. Also, we're seeing this distortion of the crypts as well. And then if we kind of look to the, um, and if we kind of look to the, the, the biopsy on the left, what we're also seeing over here um, is we're seeing what we crypt abscesses. What we're doing is we're taking one of those crypts that we see on its long axis as it kind of drew out, looking inside and what we're seeing is a little abscess here. Um, and let me kind of put my pointer on it so you guys are able to, to really see it a little bit better. Um, oops, sorry. My pointer doesn't want to draw now. All right, not working. Um, so hopefully you guys can see my arrow here, but in the middle here, um, what we see kind of uh, is one of these crypts obviously, and it's basically filled, it's basically inundated with a lot of white blood cells, basically forming an abscess, like we, you know, similar to akin to what we would see on the skin. Um, this is kind of uh, pathognomonic for one pathology, we'll kind of get to that. But here on the next slide, um, this cartoon is fantastic. It kind of shows you, okay, here's a normal colon. 
what we see really um, is uh, that these that the colon um, is basically oh, my pointers back. Um, what we see, the colon is kind of lined with cells, um, and, and these are um, columnar uh, cells here, um, and that's what this is, is really lined with. Some of these are, are, are goblet cells, um, you know, responsible for secreting mucus, um, as we would kind of expect in the colon, um, and really, this is how it should look, you know, um, this is a normal colon. And then on the right here, what we see is kind of this, um, this infiltration of neutrophils. Um, neutrophils are white blood cells. They're kind of first on the scene um, and uh, they're, they're kind of inside of these crypts. And then, you know, it kind of closes in on itself and forms these crypt abscesses. You know, similarly around the crypts, or around the, uh, these crypts, we can also see neutrophils around them, which is called um, cryptitis. Um, you know, crypt meaning is the, crypt is a structure and itis meaning infection of it. Okay, so um, that's two pathologies there. We saw a very similar presentation uh, in the, the last slide. So I hope this cartoon um, helps you kind of in, uh, imagine that a little bit better. All right, so anything else? Or is that it? Are we ready to diagnose this patient or, or what else do we wanna order? Um, a few of you guys told me infection before. So do we need to rule that out or do we know that we're, we're looking certainly at something else right now? If we're talking about diarrhea, blood, mucus, what else do we want to rule out pertaining to the GI tract? A lot of you guys kind of talked about this in your history. You asked questions to rule this in or out or to get an idea of this, to put it on your differential diagnosis, but you talked about recent travel. You talked about family condition. You talked about anything they may have uh, eaten recently. So what do we want to rule in or rule out? We talked a little bit about this last week um, in terms of uh, uh, sending the test to the lab, but it's a little bit different because the source is different. So SPRU, um, if we're talking about uh, SPRU, I think you're referring to celiac SPRU, so that would be a little bit different. So you know, obviously we can get a biopsy to, um, to see if we, uh, you know, have um, loss of, of, you know, certain architecture of the, the, um, the GI tract, usually the small intestine. Um, but what do we want to do with the stool? So we obviously saw that there was blood in it. Um, and, and we do want to pinpoint if there is an infection. So you're, you're certainly not wrong, uh, Parab, uh, but what do we want to do to rule in or rule out an infection? Send it for cultures. Yeah, good job, Brandon. Good job. Nice. Good job, Rachel. Perfect. Um, we can do an ONP. Absolutely. Yeah. So good job. That's what I was getting at. So, um, you know, if we're getting stool from this uh, guy, we want to rule in or rule out these causes. Um, you know, we did get a biopsy um, that showed a certain, um, certain architecture of the colon, but that doesn't mean that architecture didn't kind of begin with one of these infections. So the things that we want to pinpoint that cause bloody diarrhea are E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, um, C. diff, and, and Campylobacter. I know you guys are probably familiar with at least three of these things, probably E. coli, Salmonella, and C. diff. Um, and then another one that we want to consider is uh, ova and parasites. That's to look um, for eggs and parasites. We want to look at Giardia. Um, I think it was Brandon asked a brilliant question. Have you traveled recently? Um, or, you know, we might ask if they went, you know, swimming or drank um, out of a stream or something like that. Um, I, I hail from the, the uh, great state of New Mexico where um, the Rio Grande is notorious for having Giardia in it. Um, and if you know, or went swimming there, then that's always something we would want to order as an ova and parasite to, to rule out Giardia infection because it can cause a, a pretty nasty diarrhea. But we'll want to send, send stool studies. We can do um, PCR studies and we can also do cultures. Okay, 
So that's just to rule that out because we there's no way we can rule that out right now um, based on you know what we have. So we'll certainly want to order that. So keep that in mind. Keep thinking broadly because um, we don't want to miss anything for sure. All right. So the patient had back pain. Um, I know you guys forgot about this. Um, we got due to his severe back pain. We got a um, an X-ray of the lumbar spine. So, um, anybody, point out to me what you see. Good. So we see fused and rigid. Absolutely. So I see some budding, uh, some budding radiologists out there. Anybody else? So let's start kind of from the beginning, okay? I know you guys aren't radiologists, trust me, neither am I. Um, so let's start um, and kind of make this digestible. Um, so the iliac crest kind of here, you know, the, the top of the, the iliac crest um, corresponds to the level of L4, okay? So I know last week I told you this, um, whenever we want to palpate for the landmarks for um, a lumbar puncture, we like to go between L3 and L4 because that's where the spinal cord has ended. Um, and when we find those landmarks, what we can do is palpate the iliac crest on the hip, kind of march over and find L4, okay? So that's kind of one of our landmarks, but what we're looking at, and here's the spinous process, and when we look at the vertebra, we see, you know, spinous process like this. And then we see in the front kind of two transverse processes that go like this, all right? It's a terrible drawing, but it's the best I can do. Um, so, so here's spinous process here. And that's what we're looking at right here. So spinous process, spinous process, spinous process, spinous process. And you guys are absolutely right. So on x-ray, bone's gonna show up white. And what we're kind of seeing here is kind of this fused lumbar spine, you know, perhaps contributing to his, um, to his, his back pain. And um, the, what we call this, and it, when I tell you this, you know, never forget it, because once you see it, you'll never forget it. Um, is uh, th this is typically called a, a bamboo spine. Um, and, and while you're, you're on you know, this, this uh, presentation with me, Google bamboo if you've never seen it, or if you can imagine it, th this might kind of resonate with you. But this is absolutely bamboo spine. Um, I should have put a picture of bamboo right next to it for you, but this looks you know, like bamboo. And so that's why we call it bamboo spine. What we call this, is ankylosing spondylitis. Um, let me put it in the, the chat here. Ankylosing spondylitis, okay? And if you don't wanna type it out and you're a bad speller, um, just call it AS, that, that will be okay. Um, and if you wanna suggest that to me later, use AS, um, save yourself a little bit of time. But this is ankylosing spondylitis. Um, it is a um, spondyloarthropathy um, associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And then you probably say, huh, how does, a, how does a bone pathology translate to inflammatory bowel disease? We'll certainly get to that, okay? Um, Anki, Anki losing. Yeah, if that, if that helps you. I know you guys use, use Anki cards. I didn't get into Anki cards until, until med school. All right. So, um, let's keep going here. So, um, we, we're starting our, our first, uh, our first ever, um, virtual rounds feud here. So it, it is up to you guys, um, today to, um, tell me, we're going to type out together um, the di differential diagnoses. Um, you tell them to me, I'll put them on the board, and we can see how many we get in terms of differential diagnoses here, okay? So um, go ahead and shoot any differential diagnoses that you uh, want to rule in or rule out here. Yep, so we have one for ulcerative colitis. Crohn's disease, absolutely. Good. Anything else? Think of what tests we, we've gotten thus far. IBS, absolutely. Good. IBS, what else? Think about our tests that we ordered. 
And if there's concurrent diagnoses, you can absolutely list those as well. They'll kind of go under one category, but good. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly, exactly what I was going for, anemia. Colon cancer, absolutely. Um, Ramya, I don't want to, I hope I didn't butcher your name, um, but I absolutely want to acknowledge you because that is brilliant. I, you absolutely don't want to leave that out. It's less likely given that we, we had the colonoscopy and we didn't see any masses, um, but that is something that we can consider on our, um, on our differential. And when a young man or anybody comes to you and has lost 10 pounds in two months, has bloody diarrhea, um, with mucus, we absolutely want to rule out colon cancer. Absolutely. Colitis. Yes. Um, cause remember there's, um, different types of colitis. Um, so what type of colitis are you pinpointing there? There's one that I'm going for. Remember our stool cultures. Bacterial, you know what? You can even go even broader. Um, you can say an, an infectious. Um, an ulcerative, absolutely, yeah. We put that on our differential as well. But we can say ulcerative colitis because viruses and parasites can absolutely cause diarrhea, okay? Remember norovirus. Norovirus is, um, is often something that, you know, people get on cruise ships. Um, that causes bad diarrhea as well and, and vomiting, okay? So we can say infectious because that uh, encompasses viral, bacterial, and also um, parasites, okay? So you don't have to hone yourself in um, very, very um, closely right now. We can include all of those on our differentials because we haven't ruled them out just yet, okay? Um, what else? What else have we kind of discovered here that should be on our differential? We can, we can uh, think diverticulum. It, it might be less likely given that um, we, we, we didn't see that um, on our imaging and we didn't see it on our colonoscopy. Because we would certainly see diverticula on the colonoscopy. What else? What about our x-ray that we just got? Did you guys forget already? Good, perfect. All right, and then tell, tell me um, wh while we're kind of on it here, um, what, what suggested to us that this might be ulcerative colitis? There were a few findings that were pretty pathognomonic. Good, yeah, crypt abscesses, and we saw um, a little bit of um, distortion of the crypts, certainly. What about what we found physically on this patient? Ankylosing spondylitis, good job guys, you guys all put that in there. And then we saw, we thought, we saw aphthous ulcers, we saw ulcers on the leg, uh, the pyoderma, uh, pyoderma gangrenosum, absolutely. You guys are all on the right path. Um, and I'm glad I did this because I know that you guys are really thinking through this. Um, we didn't ask if he was a smoker, uh, but that's a great question to ask. And we're certainly gonna discuss that here um, in a few minutes as well. All right, so let's keep going here. Great job. I appreciate the participation, guys. So let's talk about the differential diagnosis. You guys are absolutely right. Um, this is um, inflammatory bowel disease, um, and this is probably ulcerative colitis, okay? We saw superficial ulcers on the, the colonoscopy. We saw friable mucosa. We got a biopsy of the rectum, of which showed us that there was crypt abscesses and distortion of the uh, colonic um, crypts. Okay. Um, he also had hematochesia, hematochesia um, bloody diarrhea. He had presence of ankylosing spondylitis, um, pyoderma gangrenosum, uh, I should say uh, gangrenosum, um, ulcerations and friable mucosa on colonoscopy. And then, you know, something that we can consider um, and you should always consider and put it on your differential as you guys absolutely did is, um, is Crohn's disease, less likely because we're not seeing um, 
formation of uh, granulomas on the biopsy. That's another finding that we would see. Um, as you guys kind of indicated, infectious colitis, we haven't ruled that out just yet. We sent in our stool studies um, and, and this will determine if there's an infectious cause, um, virus, bacterial, uh, parasites, okay? All right, and then irritable bowel syndrome, absolutely. You guys are absolutely right. Um, it doesn't sound, you know, um, textbook for that, uh, it, you know, but we don't want to sort of hone in or hone out on, uh, you know, irritable bowel syndrome. It certainly can, okay? And then colorectal cancer. Um, as I kind of indicated, we certainly want to um, keep that on our radar. Okay, and we didn't see a mass, we didn't see uh, polyps, precancerous polyps on our um, on our colonoscopy, so that's less likely as well. You guys did great. Um, I am very, very impressed that um, as a team, you guys got every single differential diagnosis. Well done. You guys are a very brilliant group. Um, you should be very proud of yourself. This was, you know, a, a difficult case as well, and you guys got all of the, the differentials. Well done. All right. So in terms of the assessment and plan, um, we kind of pinpointed that this guy might have um, ulcerative colitis. So um, what do we want to do for this patient? We can give him steroids. What is kind of the mainstay treatment of ulcerative colitis? Does anybody know? And if you don't, that's okay. So we can keep steroids in mind if this patient is in a flare, but that is not necessarily the treatment for, um, you know, that not the kind of mainstay of treatment for ulcerative colitis. Fecal transplant. Fecal transplant can help um, if there's a, a problem with C. diff and if they have kind of recurrent C. diff that's refractory to antibiotics, um, then we can treat them with a fecal transplant. Salicylates, absolutely, yeah. Surgery, we can consider surgery, but surgery is usually for refractory um, ulcerative colitis. Anti-inflammatory drugs, absolutely, yeah. You're absolutely on, on point, Cassidy. Um, if we're dealing with ulcerative colitis inflammation of the colon, let's pinpoint the inflammation. Good job. So you guys are, are right on track here. And when you don't know the answer, use use your logic, and you guys absolutely did that. So I would call this mild to moderate um, ulcerative colitis, and we have evidence that it was present in the rectum. So it's kind of a distal, meaning the distal aspect of the colon, okay? So we wanna begin mesalamine suppositories, and these are salicylate drugs. Um, so mesalamine and um, sulfasalazine, um, those are uh, salicylate uh, drugs. They're um, anti-inflammatory, as Cassidy kind of indicated. Um, and then we can consider a um, oral corticosteroid if this um, if it, the ulcerative colitis does not respond to the um, the salicylates, or if this patient's in a flare. Um, other than this, um, we we want to consult with uh, gastroenterology um, and then uh, for follow up as well um, for the pyoderma gangrenosum. But um, this is, you know, certainly an extra intestinal manifestation. Ulcerative um, There's no specific type um, and in fact, um, taking a biopsy may make it worse in that um, there is this phenomenon called pathergy where, you know, if you um, prick the skin in another spot, they might develop pyoderma gangrenosum there. Um, and that's often a test that people use to diagnose it. Um, but we can treat uh, pyoderma gangrenosum with a topical steroid. Um, we want to use a potent topical steroid such as uh, clobazol. Um, and then we can also use topical um, cyclosporin as well. That's an, an option, or I'm sorry, uh, tacrolimus. It's a calcineurin inhibitor. Um, other than this, we do have an iron deficiency anemia. So what do we do when we're deficient in iron? Let's give the patient iron, okay? And then let's follow the, the um, CBC um, in about six weeks. And uh, PO meaning by mouth, we can give by mouth iron. And QD means every day. All right. Um, other than this, the patient has ankylosing spondylitis. Um, given um, his symptoms, uh, appears to be mild to moderate as well. So we can treat the pain with um, anti-inflammatory drugs as well. All right. 
So let's talk about the pathology um, with our remaining time here. There's a lot to talk about to differentiate um, ulcerative colitis and, and um, Crohn's disease, okay? Um, sometimes they're confused. Um, we're talking a lot about ulcerative colitis today. That's where a case talked about, but um, there are a lot of people of whom have ulcerative colitis. Probably, you probably know somebody of whom has ulcerative colitis of whom does, does not talk about it. It's a pretty irritating um, illness, um, much as irritable bowel syndrome is, and um, you know, much as Crohn's disease, um, obviously ulcerative colitis as well. So um, that being said, um, let's differentiate the two. So when we think ulcerative colitis, um, and when we think bowel inflammation, we want to differentiate um, between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, okay? In terms of location, um, ulcerative colitis always begins with the rectum. Um, that is always kind of the, the point that, that we want to make. Whereas Crohn's disease um, really can affect any part of the GI tract from mouth to anus. And what we often see is this uh, thing called skip lesions. And in Crohn's disease, it's often rectal sparing, meaning it doesn't actually affect the rectum. So that is a big differ differentiating factor between the two. Then on gross morphology, when we look at the colon via colonoscopy, we see transmural inf inflammation with Crohn's disease where it affects all three layers of the um, colon. So um, there is a cartoon here that shows this. So we see three distinct layers. Um, obviously there's a muscular layer as well, but we see the mucosa, submucosa, and serosa. In Crohn's disease, we see that it affects all three layers. So transmural meaning the whole thing while um, ulcerative colitis affects only two. Um, so let me change my pointer here. So it affects only two here. So um, ulcerative colitis affects the submucosa and mucosa only. So we see kind of this friable mucosa. We absolutely saw that on our colonoscopy. And then we can see um, superficial or deep ulcerations. We saw superficial. Um, and then we also see this loss of, of hostra, meaning these kind of undulations in the mucosa of the colon. And what we see is kind of this lead pipe appearance where the, the colon kind of appears uh, blown up and not with the, the kind of um, normal uh, architecture that we would see. And then in Crohn's disease, we see something called cobblestoning. And that's what I've shown you here in the bottom right-hand corner. If you've ever seen kind of those old fashioned roads, um, sometimes we see them in old cities, but um, I think often you see them in like Spain. Um, I know I saw them in uh, Guatemala, the kind of uh, classic cobblestone roads. If you look at this, it does look like cobblestone. And then we see this other um, kind of thing called creeping fat. Creeping fat is due to the fact that there is kind of transmural inflammation affecting the whole wall of the colon at different stages of healing, meaning there's kind of this fat um, in, 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 in intertwined between involved in the healing process, okay? We see wall thickening, we see fissures. Um, other than this, complications um, are, it, actually let's backtrack and talk about um, the microscopic pathology. Um, we saw cryptabscesses, we saw ulcerations, um, but we see no granulomas. In Crohn's disease, we do see granulomas, okay? Some of the extraintestinal manifestations are very similar. So um, that doesn't give us any clues. So instead, let's focus on the things of which are different. Um, Ulcerative colitis, you can get a uh, toxic megacolon, meaning kind of this ballooning of the, um, of the colon, of dil like gross dilatation of the colon. We can see perforation as a result. And toxic meaning we kind of get this systemic toxicity. Um, other than this, we can get fulminant colitis, or fulminant colitis, which is kind of a very severe form of ulcerative colitis. And then with Crohn's disease, we could see fistulas, which are um, basically um, tracks between the colon and other organs, which is bad. Um, but um, we're going to talk about the treatment later, but that's kind of the main differentiating factors between the two. Um, they are very similar. Sometimes they get confused, but there are things that are, that are different. Um, and based on those things, I think you will be able to answer my questions later, but let's keep moving here to talk about the definition. 
Um, and, and what we really do here, um, it seems simple, but what we do is we base this on um, a few things. We base it from mild, moderate, severe, and fulminant based on how many stools per day, uh, the presence or absence of blood in the stool. If there's inflammation, we use the ESR. And if there's systemic toxicity, meaning, you know, if somebody's having 10 plus stools per day, blood in the stool, um, their inflammatory markers are elevated and they appear toxic or they have signs of toxicity, then this would be fulminant. Um, whereas, you know, our guy um, had five um, stools per day, had the presence of, um, had the presence of blood, uh, ESR, you know, was, was normal or was elevated, a little bit elevated um, and, and wasn't, you know, exactly toxic. We might call our guy um, mild to moderate. Okay. So this is, you know, fairly straightforward. It doesn't really kind of uh, always equate to this. this. This is probably a simplistic version of, of kind of this classification of, of ulcerative colitis. All right, risk factors um, or etiology. Um, so we, the etiology and the actual cause of ulcerative colitis is not exactly known. And everybody hates in medicine when that happens. Um, you know, trust me, patients hate it too. Um, not knowing where this is coming from. There seems to be a genetic um, etiology, a family history component, and it seems to run along the lines of other autoimmune conditions, as Rachel pointed out to us. Um, it can certainly follow recent infections um, with Salmonella or Campylobacter. Um, age is a risk factor, meaning that often um, younger patients, we saw our patient was very young, 26 years old, um, and we kind of see a bimodal strike or a, a bimodal um, distribution of this, meaning um, it can affect young people and then a little bit of an older population as well. Um, but our, our typical population is usually young males less than 30 years old. Um, we see this um, curious risk factor in Western nations of higher latitudes. This seems to be a correlation with um, UV light exposure. Um, and then also we see a, um, a risk factor with um, diet, uh, meaning high protein, lots of meats increases your risk, where high fiber decreases your risk. Um, NSAID use also increases your risk. And then curiously, um, smoking is a protective factor for, um, for ulcerative colitis. And this doesn't mean that when this happens, we say, you know, hey, hey patient, um, you should certainly go out and smoke. Um, but what we see is this curious kind of distribution with patients that ulcerative colitis patients, despite you know, their immense suffering, um, do live longer than the general population. And this is because most patients that have ulcerative colitis um, either are never, have, never smoked or quit smoking. Uh, but what we see um, with ulcerative colitis as a protective factor with smoking, being that smoking, it usually decreases the immune response. So um, that inadvertently decreases the inflammation, the white blood cells attacking your colon. Um, also an appendectomy seems to decrease your risk as well. Um, that's kind of a lesser known association. And then along the same lines of smoking, um, while smoking decreases your risk of ulcerative colitis, it increases your risk of Crohn's disease. So that's a very curious um, sort of association as well, but a pretty well-established one as well. Um, all right, so let's keep going here. Um, physical exam, usually unremarkable. Usually our physical exam is not that helpful, but we may find nonspecific things like abdominal tenderness, um, you might see blood on our digital rectal exam. We might see a fever, tachycardia, or weight loss. Um, labs, we might use the P-ANCA. The P-ANCA is a test, um, an autoimmune marker that is usually positive um, in uh, ulcerative colitis. So we might use that. We might use CRP or ESR for um, signs of inflammation. Our CBC, our complete blood count, might show us anemia. Um, electrolytes in the CMP might be distorted. And then we can use uh, bowel um, or intestinal uh, signs of inflammation like the fecal calprotectin, alpha-1 antitrypsin, 
or the lactoferrin um, to indicate signs of intestinal inflammation. Um, other than that, we'll want to pinpoint um, stool studies to make sure there's no bacterial, viral, ovum, and parasite um, etiologies. And then we can use, as we kind of learned, the colonoscopy. Um, we can use the barium enema, or we can use ultrasound, CT, or MRI to kind of um, look at the, the GI tract as well. Okay. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy. I know we're running over in time. Um, if you guys have to go, I certainly understand. I do have some questions in terms of uh, participation for you. This was a little bit more. Um, I wanted to make sure I took the time to talk about both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So for, forgive me for going a little bit over here. We're going to talk a little bit about... Um, uh, anatomy here. I want to incorporate anatomy and in. I usually don't do this, um, but this is important for, for the GI pathology. So what we see in Crohn's disease is kind of this idea of skip lesions. So for Crohn's disease, we see like kind of uh, inflammation and signs of disease um, all over the place. Then um, for but, and then also in, in terms of uh, Crohn's disease, we also see kind of this um, this manifestation in the ileum. Um, so we, we, we see it, it often does involve the ileum. And if you remember B12, um, B12 is absorbed in the ileum. Um, and yes, this will be posted on the YouTube. Um, and if you missed the first uh, few minutes, you can um, certainly log in and, and watch it on the, um, the YouTube as well. But uh, B12 is absorbed in the ileum. So what we see with patients with Crohn's disease is they're often deficient in vitamin B12. And if you remember my anemia lecture from Lowe, you can get um, subacute degenerative cord, um, a neurological manifestation um, where you get macrocytic cells. Um, so you get a macrocytic anemia. Okay. And then um, in terms of ulcerative colitis, what we see is kind of this um, inflammation in the rectum. Um, it always kind of involves the rectum. That's ulcerative colitis. So that's what I wanted to really show you there with that anatomy. Um, and now um, here is kind of the um, complication. So what we kind of look at is dominant um, colitis, so the severe form of, of um, ulcerative colitis. We see toxic megacolon, which um, the x-ray image there is indicating toxic megacolon, that kind of dilatation of the colon. We could see perforation where you get a hole in the colon. That is absolutely a surgical emergency. Um, we could see colorectal cancer. And in this, um, uh, this image here, um, this colon colonoscopy image, we see kind of a fungating mass, perhaps obstructing the colon. We could also see anemia and dehydration. All right, so I have a few questions for you guys. I have three, okay? Um, thank you for everybody who kind of has um, stuck around here. I just have a few more slides left, okay? So uh, let me um, launch this for you guys. And I would like to have uh, nearly everybody participate here. Um, so let me launch it. Um, so a 33-year-old male presents with a history of eye redness. Um, history reveals three to four episodes of diarrhea uh, with mucus per day. Um, so go ahead um, and answer what you think it is here. Um, we may not have talked about this specifically, um, but I hope that you guys can kind of, by process of elimination, um, pinpoint this. Um, and then um, we will certainly discuss it. You guys are doing great so far. All right, so that's one minute. Um, let me share the results here. So the majority of you guys got it. This is anterior uveitis. Um, and what happens with this is this is an extra intestinal manifestation of ulcerative colitis as well, um, and also Crohn's disease. And what we see is kind of this inflammation of the iris um, in, the, um, in the, the, ce the celial body as well. And um, 
it, it's also just really a sign of inflammation. So um, that's what this is. It's anterior um, uveitis. Um, remember, pyoderma gangrenosum is that ulcer on the skin. Um, creeping fat and cobblestoning, usually we see those on colonoscopy. Um, at this ulcer is usually that ulcer um, on the, the buccal mucosa. Um, guaiac positive stool means blood in the stool. Um, ankylosing spondylitis, we saw that on the x-ray, okay, that bamboo spine. Erythema nodosum is kind of these erythematous nodules on the skin. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like, really, okay? So let me stop sharing the results here and let's go to the next slide, okay? So here is, um, let me relaunch this for you. Um, similar vignette, a 23-year-old male presenting with um, mouth lesions, which onset two days ago. History reveals three to four episodes of diarrhea with mucus daily and intermittent fatigue and fevers. Um, I hope you guys all get this. You will make me very proud. All right, you guys are doing great. So 95% of you um, said aphthous ulcers, and you would be absolutely right. These are abscess or aphthous ulcers. Um, remember, it's a cute way of saying it. Um, also a sign um, in the, the buccal mucosa. So great job. Um, so let me relaunch this for you guys, and let's go on to our last one here. And then we'll talk about the treatment and uh, you guys will, will be done hearing my voice for the evening. So um, you guys probably remember this one. Um, it, it's probably by far the most cringe, uh, the cr most cringy thing I've showed you this evening, um, other than maybe the colonoscopy. But um, this is a 35 year old male presenting with a four day history of a gross skin rash. And, and this patient's absolutely right, they're not wrong. Um, history reveals a five to six episodes of diarrhea with blood and mucus daily. All right, let me share that there. 95% of you guys, um, great job. Um, this is absolutely pyoderma gangrenosum, um, and it's kind of that, that inflammation, that ulcer on the skin. Remember, we treat that with um, topical uh, corticosteroids, um, such as clobetazole. We can also use topical tacrolimus for that as well. All right, so let me stop sharing that. Um, I just have a couple more slides for you here. Um, so here's kind of that cartoon. I think it's helpful. This guy is um, very talented. His, uh, his name is uh, Jorge um, Muniz, um, and he is, uh, has the website MedComic. Very talented. I like to, to throw these in to kind of uh, show his work, and it, he does a great job of kind of contrasting these things. This is available on my slide, so you can take a look at that. So finally, the treatment, which is at the, the, gonna be the most important thing that you, you talk to patients um, about with this. They wanna know how they can be treated for um, their ulcerative colitis, okay? So, and, and like a lot of things I've talked about so far um, in the last few months, there is kind of a stepwise approach um, or the step-up approach. And what we see is really, um, we start with the amino salicylates, um, such as um, mesalamine or sulfazeazine. Then we can use antibiotics if there's signs of infection or topical um, or, uh, or corticosteroids as well. Um, remember, um, the salicylates can be used um, orally. There's also suppositories for these as well. And as you can imagine, using a suppository um, might give the patient sort of quicker relief from their inflammation in their colon. Um, next up, um, we can consider using um, immunomodulators. And what we consider here is um, things like epirine. Uh, um, and what's not listed here is uh, six mecaptopurine. So those are. Um, uh, purine uh, sort of modulators there. Um, and then we could also use cyclosporine and then methotrexate as well. 
And then uh, once we, in, in that regard also, we can use um, oral corticosteroids as well. And then when the, when the disease is severe, we wanna use things known as biologics. These are things that are inhibiting um, the, the tumor necrosis factor alpha. Um, the reason why we don't jump to these right away is it takes more monitoring. Um, we have to obviously watch the immune system. We have to watch the white blood cell count. Um, and it can be you know, more um, intensive on the immune system itself. Um, you know, we can obviously you know, make a connection to imagine um, patients of whom were being treated with biologics um, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and still. Um, you know, when there is COVID around, you would have to kind of keep in mind about this and, and be cognizant of that. Then as kind of a, a last ditch effort, surgery is kind of um, what we consider curative for um, ulcerative colitis, but um, that's easier said than done. Um, with surgery, what we're talking about is a colectomy. So we're taking out the patient's colon um, and usually putting in an, um, an ostomy. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that does reduce the inflammation of the colon, um, and, and that's fairly obvious um, why, though um, that, that's very intensive on the patient. So you can imagine um, why we kind of have the step-up approach to the treatment of, um, of ulcerative colitis, okay? Right here, I add these, uh, um, it has the, the brand names here. Um, obviously, you might uh, recognize some of these from TV. Uh, such as Humira. Um, that's one of the drugs of which is used also to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And as you can kind of see here, none of these things really pinpoint the cause of ulcerative colitis because we're not really sure where it actually comes from. These are really things to treat the inflammation associated with ulcerative colitis. Okay. So um, let, I have one more question for you guys here. Um, let me share this with you. And um, let's see, let me relaunch this for you. So if you would please take a few seconds here to, to reflect about what you've learned here. Um, sorry I went over the time guys, um, I, that seems to be my trend, but I, I want you to know as much as you can during these sessions. Um, and as always, you're always free to go um, whenever you can. I, I don't get um, insulted by any means by that. Um, and there's a few people of whom have yet to answer, and then I will share this for you. But um, as, thank you guys for your time. Um, I'm always grateful when I get to spend my week with you guys. Um, you know, education is, is certainly one of my passions, um, and I always have a good time talking with you guys doing it. Um, let me share this with you so you guys can get a good idea here. Um, I'm very, uh, very humbled, very honored. A lot of you guys said you know some and you know not, uh, or you know a lot. So um, nobody said uh, I know nothing or I know a little. So I'm very humbled. I'm very grateful for your guys' time. I hope you learned something today. 